uh, let's just, I guess, get going with who we have and um, say, oh, good. Now the lights are going out. <laughs> yeah, this is really happening for me. Um, Pat, why don't you introduce Aton, your... If you... Jennifer. Um, yeah, hi. Um, Pat Attilio here. Um, I've, I've had the working group invites all along, but uh, one reason or another, I haven't been able to join um, until now. I uh, thank you for having me, and I will be a fly on the wall and make only constructive comments. So okay. <laughs> carry on. Susanna. Hello, Susanna Davis, Racial Equity Director. Um, and Aton, if it's helpful, if you can't see the full participant list, I'm happy to go down and call the roll for you because I, I can see the full list. See the full list. Oh, that sounds like a good idea. He sounds, he's already frozen. Okay, should I? I Hey, Ton, we're, we're, you're freezing up. Great. I'm going to do what my dad always says and take initiative, and I'm going to call the roll. Yep. So next, next I've got a phone number ending in 9147. That's Robin from Crime Research. All right. Ian? Hi, Ian Loris. I'm Aton's uh, assistant note taker. All right, Karen. Hi, everyone. Karen Gannett, Crime Research Group. Aton, I don't remember if you introduced yourself. Would you like to do so? Hi. Theoretically, I'm the chair, but I'm actually technologically challenged. <laughs> All right. Uh, Pat has already gone. Julio. Let me make myself visible here. Julio Thompson, uh, Attorney General's Office. Rebecca. Uh, Rebecca Turner, uh, Defender General's Office. Wichi. Uh, Wichi Artu, uh, pronouncing he, him as they them theirs, uh, data engineer appointed by Susana Davis. All right, Mr. Chair, that completes the attendance. Wow, I, you, you know, it's funny. I think I did. We just have a very small group tonight. Um, Monica couldn't make it. Um, Evan couldn't make it. Uh, Tyler Allen couldn't make it. Said that he thought Elizabeth would be able to be here. Um, Sheila has unfortunately had a death in her circle, so she won't be able to make it um, for a bit here. Um, and I'm trying to think of who else said they couldn't make it. I think Evan may not have been able to. So it really is just this very small group. Um, and let's just forge ahead and get as much done as we can. Um, I thank you all for being patient. I get really angry when technology doesn't work. I throw things. All of that maturity goes right out the window. And I was really, really close. So thank you very much for being very patient and understanding. Um, to start off, I wanted to say I had a very, I, my brain didn't work very well this week, but the one thought that I did have, the, um, sort of connected to where we were at the end of the large meeting on Tuesday was that the community, I mean, we have to work out who this governing body is. But I was going to suggest that the community members, the people with lived experience, there's a particular term that the toolkit uses that I can for some reason not remember. 
but that those help with the nuts and bolts body that Karen and Monica had proposed, but that they also sit on the governing body up. And the reason I thought that useful is not merely the continuity, but what that continuity means. In other words, that they will then have a sense of where things need to go and where they can go because they will have sat through discussions about what data exists, what data don't exist, what can exist, what can't, all those sorts of things. In other words, it serves in a strange way as a sort of education um, so that once the body gets going, actually governing, they've really got it, or at least that's my hope. That was my major thought this week. In terms of thinking about what the govern who the governing body is, didn't get that far. But I did get to the blending idea. I like that idea, Aton. I have to admit that um, even though I, I recommended and was very familiar with AISP's toolkit at the beginning of August, I'm right now today just coming into it, meaning to have gone through and reviewed what they recommended for the actual exercise of identifying the board members. Do any of you have that page number handy or page numbers um, or, or can recall like the part of it? Because I also had, didn't come in. I figured we would work together on that exact thing tonight. And then yeah. Okay. So you're hoping that my computer might actually you know, function, um, which would be, God, if I'm trying to get to the toolkit. Fantastic. No, and Susanna just put it in the chat. Oh, okay. And if anyone has, because it's, I see it's 76 pages and, and, and I know there was, I remember it's, seeing. It's near the beginning. Is it the page 40 on mapping assets and engaging community? I think so. That's what I remember. Because it was very clear about how to how to choose people. And I thought that was. Yes. I mean, Here, the other part right, that... thank you. I, sorry. I, I just agree with Susanna's recommendation, specifically 42, step three. I mean, the earlier steps was about mission, not to skip those steps, but um, in terms of the actual six Ps, identifying the six Ps in your community and their asset dimensions. Um, Let's see. I mean, the reality is with this is I think what we would be able to do is quote it and put it in the report and simply hope that it has meaning for the legislature. I don't think that we are going to be able to do much more than that. Um, my suspicion is that what will happen 
will be something like what happened with the Criminal Justice Council, where um, the governor appointed 12 people on the recommendation of, well, I mean, what? There were, there were people recommended by the two NAACP chapters, um, and he, he took them. I think it may end up being something akin to that. Though, as we say, we can recommend this. Mm. I'm just saying, I don't, you know, I think we're limited to some degree in what we're going to be able to get. Right. You, no, I'm, I'm hearing you. Karen, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I just I just wanted to say I think it's a really good idea to reference and put the link in for that document in our report because it has so much good information in it. And I just think mm -hmm. it's a really valuable resource for the governing body and the nuts and bolts committee both. And just to have it be a guiding document. OK. OK, I. Which yeah, I I agree that linking it is important. It's for, like, but very, but I would almost want like the specific pages, especially like when we think about uh, page thirty six that talks about identify your stakeholders. Like, it's like very like I look at this and I'm like, oh, this is like I know exactly who should be at the table when I look at this list. So and and so it's important to like make sure that we know that we have say in who's going to be part of that table considering all the conversations we've had. I, I'm also wondering, isn't one of our um, outputs supposed to be like a, um, something like a bill, uh, not just a report? Yes, yes. So I think we can almost like, um, you know, but being carefully careful not to plagiarize, but almost like copy and paste a section of like who should be at this table because we talk about like the people who own the data, the people who are going to fund it, who's going to use it, um, then other like public interest groups, etc. Just want to note that that we should we should make sure that we 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 have that we're able to help focus who should be at the table, not just like here read this. Okay, uh, I'll take a stab at this this week. I actually have some, I shudder to say I have free time because that seems like you're telling bragging to people, but um, I have some space this week where I could actually take a stab at writing that. Um, Rebecca? So I, I do, Thanks, Wichi. I, th I think it is 34 that was 36, sorry, identifying your stakeholders. Um, and, and yes, and yes, in terms of Karen and Wichi, your, your recommendation of, of linking and going even more detailed in page numbers and linking. But what if, could we tonight even take a stab at identifying some of the obvious, the core stakeholders? Um, whose engagement is central to data infrastructure is what their point was. Um, bullet two, other stakeholders, other direct stakeholders who can facilitate success but who are not part of the core group, and other stakeholders. And then um, and then the sub-questions. I'm just wondering if we, do you want to try to take a stab at, at identifying specifics? I would. Yeah, I think that's I mean, a good idea, too. If we start with core stakeholders, can, can does, do people agree that the RDAP uh, government reps are a big starting point, at least for the government stakeholders? Is that right or not? Should we not? Maybe we should. We shouldn't start with any presumption. Just start with a clean slate, actually, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Let's do that. Let's do that. Let's come in with with no pre preset pre pre pre, pre judgments. I was thinking geographically and thinking of groups around the state. Um, and I don't 
Now, when I say geographically, I'm not sure what I was doing. I'm not sure that I was doing it by county or what. But thinking of groups that represent historically stigmatized communities and looking at getting a sense of who those Nitan, if you can hear us, you're, you're, you're going in and out. And then talking about representatives from each of them. So that certainly would be some, you know, there'd be somebody from, from each of them. Uh, I'm not sure what to do. I, I think still going in and out. You are, but no, I, a little okay. bit. Um, I'm returning your video. Turning my bit down. There. I hope this is better. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. This is the two double NAACP chapters. Um, in up in the Pride Center would be a big one. Um, the analogs of the Pride Center, whose name I can never remember, even though I live in Wyndham County. Um, H.B. Loisita runs it. Um, out in the open or outright? That, uh, out in the open. Thank you. And outright. And I, I mean, I think we should get a, it, it should be a really sort of comprehensive list of those groups. And then we can work from there. Does that seem reasonable? I, I think it would be a fabulous resource for the red legislature if even in an appendix we provide a list of all of the organizations we think should at least be in the consider you know in the running or consider you know considered um, or relevant for this whether or not it's at the table it's or you know I like it Aton. I would add ALV um, I would add migrant justice I would add um, you know, ACLU, um, other other groups you guys want to toss out? I, I put in the chat, Pat Rachel. put in the chat. Yeah. Oh. Racial Justice Alliance. Yes, great. Uh, this is Robin. Any mental health organizations? Not yet, but let's put, do you have some specific suggestions? Um, <laughs> uh, I'm trying to think of what Wilda's organization is. Um, Mad Vermont, yeah. Mad, Mad Freedom, Freedom. Yeah. Mad Freedom. Um, there's none oh, in Vermont. Uh, the group, the Karen. Whoops, I lost you, Aton. The whites. Um, Mad Freedom. Isn't it Mad Freedom? Mad Freedom. Mad Freedom. Yep. Uh, yes. Um, the other thing I wanted to say, just following the thread of intersection points, um, we know that in Vermont, people of color skew younger. So it would be really helpful to couple our efforts with um, generational equity things, or at least to think about youth as an interested party. What's the word? Not interested party, but you know what I mean. Stakeholder constituency. Stakeholder, yeah. All right. Right. So I, I, I recommend Washington County Youth Services because they do a lot of um, community engagement with youth, in, at least in Washington County. Great. With she, your hand is up. Yeah, I just also want to call attention that it's important that I definitely agree that all these community organizations should be at the table. I also think it's worth no noting that those who own the data and those who are going to use the data should also be at the table in order to ha actually be able to have a conversation of what's possible. Right. So Department of Corrections, DCF, state's attorney's offices, Defender General's office. 
again, I'm just thinking big, not being censoring on my list, Department of Ed, right? Right. Um, judiciary. 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 <laughs> no, I didn't get that yet. Um, uh, the uh, ATO. Attorney generals. Attorney yeah, so General, somebody from yeah. DPS and then somebody from the data governance boards of the cops. So they'll have one when they, right now they've got two data governance boards. And, I, um, and then they'll have one. And then maybe there will be none. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Um, <laughs> um, I made you laugh though. Um, yeah. Yes, so the cops, and then uh, you said DCF, and it's always, always, you know, sometimes people invite mental health to these meetings, and sometimes they don't invite mental Department of Mental Health. I've never figured out when or why or how, but I'm just saying somebody might invent, invite them. I can imagine there being friction between Mad Freedom and the Department. Sure, health, um, but Department of Mental Health maybe owns we shouldn't data. worry about that. Yeah, they own yeah. data, um, and it may be that you know that's I mean, true because that's protected health data, um, but at least data in the aggregate or data that is you know can be added to data sets that could help inform what we're seeing in different areas of the state or something like that. Um, right. And right. Rebecca, the CJCs. Yeah, because they're separate and have their own data uh, collection efforts. What are what are what what? <laughs> What's a CJC? I'm sorry, I was. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm else the acronym. Community thing. Justice Centers. Thank so you. So they do they do the um, they do some of the diversion programs. They do a, um, a lot of innovative programming, um, but they do keep their own data and don't necessarily share it with anyone. Right. Okay. Pat, you have your hand up and then Witchy. Uh, yeah, this, this may be very obvious, but yeah, um, I, and we're taking notes here. You want to bucket the, these different stakeholders by, you know, what their role is, if they're, you know, if they're contributors, if they're receivers, if they're just consulted, um, you know, we can use the breakdown that's in that document, but that'll that'll be helpful to make sure we've got everybody covered. I think. Well, that Ian, can I ask while you're taking these notes, when you send them to me, I'm gonna just I'll like write that in when you get them to me. What you know, sort of the roles of these people. So if you, you just keep good notes about who we're throwing out here that would be helpful and and julio has put three lists into the chat as well thank you witchy uh two things uh, one that's how nice i i went to the chat for one moment so go ahead um, Okay, uh, two things. One, uh, making sure that we bring some disability lens in here. So I'd, um, I'm sure there's an organization out there that can help provide that and be in that committee or be in the running. Um, and another one is just recognize, wanting to sort of recognize that power dynamics is a real thing in a committee like this um, and wanting to make sure that um, you know, like the, the, the community should have and community organizations should have a powerful voice, not to overshadow necessarily the data owners or, or data users, but just, just noting that um, who are we doing this for uh, and recognizing that when we establish some type of, you know, a decision making structure or whatever it is that we decide. Um, but when we put these people together that we, we do it in recognition of how power dynamics are going to play into this and that we empower those who need to be empowered. Okay. I think um, I'm just- I have thinking. a question if you go, Chance. Go for it. Okay, thank you. So as listening to what you talked there, and I was thinking about some of the ways that we do our projects, um, 
and that we pull together stakeholders for each project that we have um, because we want different areas of expertise in the room and we don't want to burn you all out by saying come sit on this committee and so you can supervise me doing my work um, and so I was thinking about that in context of the bureau as you're going to propose it and not that anyone likes reporting but I think giving the director or whatever position um, a requirement to put together um, different stakeholder groups so that you're not burning out, especially the community members who were going, you know, so you don't have to go to every meeting if it's really not touching. Oh, sorry. If it's really not touching on what you're doing and that the director puts a, um, a report to the legislature every year and to RDAP, these are the people we consulted, um, and this is their impact that they had. Um, so it's forcing kind of like a record-keeping and an impact analysis of the meetings that you're having so that people aren't just going to meetings for the sake of it, but also really documenting how people are, um, how their voices are being, um, I don't want to say the word used, but I'm going to, used in this process um, to create uh, the data sets and the data integration. Okay. Richie, do you have anything to add to that? Because you usually have these really subtle philosophical points that you combine with the technical know-how that I'm I'm gotten a little bit hooked on. <laughs> well, I'm glad I'm bringing value. Um, I I don't I don't have tools or anything in mind. Um, I, I think that addressing the power dynamics is going to be like, it's going to need to be a group effort, like all of us putting our brains together. I think, um, Robin, I'm, I'm sorry if I got your name wrong, but or, or I think Robin just mentioned a wonderful way to create some type of accountability around who is saying what and how, and like what decisions are ultimately being made by whose voice. Um, so I think that's definitely a tool that can, uh, help be, uh, like help address that. Okay. And, you know, I wanted to also just support what our second or what it, which you said earlier about when we when we choose this group. And I know we're doing a big we want to capture all the possible people who should we should think about and not miss and, and get this long list. And then we should talk about ideal size uh, or what is, a, an, a you know, I don't think it's again, it's seeming like we're, we're less inclined to come up with a specific actual board um, suggested membership and more of philosophical or fundamental principles that should be considered. Maybe I don't know. Maybe we're, we'll get to something more concrete. But mm. size. But but more importantly, what which you pointed out, I just don't want to get lost is weight. That that um, that we can't have these numbers where ultimately we're losing sense of um, there's just one or two or three in proportionate to, uh, of, of voices from from the people who actually are the data, right? Right. As compared to everyone else, we also want to make sure they're, they're, they're involved because they, they own the data, they control the data, they could obstruct data sharing, right? All of that stuff, but we want to make sure, and I think that's really key, and I, just, I agree with Witchy that we have to be cognizant, like if we're going to build in protections here, that is a fundamental starting point, which is that whatever numbers, whoever's at the table, we should agree on the representative weight of uh, who is at the table just overall, right? And making sure that they're not mm -hmm. people who are stand to lose the most. Um, again, people who have the lived experiences and people who represent their interests. I'm going to be honest. I'm going to suck at that. I'm going to be very honest about this because I realize, I mean, we've named what? Probably, I mean, so far this body has at least 30 people on it, probably. I mean, I don't think that that's an overstatement given the conversation so far. Um, I'm just sorry, and that's, that, I, I just, that's so unworkable. I mean, just logistically, it's, it's insane. But I am, I suck at narrowing things down. I am not good at that. So I'm just putting that out there with the hope 
that other people are really good at it because I'm going to have a hard time narrowing it down. I'm really good at coming up with a list of, oh, let's put them on, let's put them on and so on. But, um, but then we would have a body of a hundred. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't know if others agree with that. I, I agree that we're not looking to have a representative of every racial justice oriented organization on this board. Um, I, I do think there is a point where it just becomes un, unworkable. But what people, what I'm hearing is something, someone representing mental health, the intersectionality perspectives we want to make sure are, uh, are the key ones that we want to make sure are representative. Maybe that's how we approach it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's a good idea. Pat? Yeah, and, and again, it's kind of the same comment I made before that if we create the if we create buckets like key stakeholders or, or whatnot, it'll help the prioritization. We don't, you know, it would be futile to come and try to come up with a, like a numeric weight of how much influence a particular organization has. But if you oh, if you have the core group and then the group that you inform and the group that you consult occasionally. And kind of define the role, all those roles of, or categories of stakeholders. That'll help you uh, with that bucketing. Okay. It's a good list so far. I think. And so far, we haven't tried to divide them up based on juvenile and adult. Um, I was. But one of my recommendations from there. The others, do you remember when we had that demographic decision-making point um, in our report of last year, and then we went and, and identified further within the demographics category what we were hoping to capture? And that, I wonder if that's our starting, I don't know. I, I, I'm thinking, Pat, about your suggestion about breaking up the suggested lists right now into buckets. And I'm thinking of maybe calling each bucket. Can we come put some labels on some of those buckets and, and try to sure. put them in? Uh, well, for a starting point, you could use what's in the uh, in the uh, AISP document, the core stakeholders, the other direct stakeholders. I, I, and we can just modify that if you want a starting point. I'm looking at page uh, 36 there. Right. I works for me. Witchy. Do I just want a clarification? The the cr criminal in data stuff source for um, young folks and for adults in the criminal system. Do they come from separate data systems, or they just come from? Oh yeah. Oh God. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the, the 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 courts adjudicate. Sorry, um, the courts adjudicate everybody, and we have a unified system which makes us better than other states. Um, so you would get juvenile disposition data as far as um, you know how many kids were sentenced to probation or adjudicated, you know, um, and since we've expanded the juvenile court to include a broader definition of juveniles, um, that information will all come from the judiciary. Um, one of the groups that, that has information about juveniles that don't have information about adults is DCF, and DCF is often involved in the um, truancy cases and other cases that um, involve juveniles, as are the CJCs. Some of them, have, uh, one actually has a, a truancy program. Um, so yeah, no, different places. Sorry. Okay, well, I'm glad I asked for that clarification. Thanks. <laughs> Department and Ed, I'd throw in there, right? Um, yeah. Where's some more overlap with the courts and the, from the juvenile and, crim and, and adults um, sectors? I'd say courts, state's attorney's office, attorney general's office, right? Defender General's Office, mm -hmm. not DOC. Well, 
I mean, there's crossover with youthful yeah. offenders. Yeah, there's right? yeah, yeah. There's crossover with youthful offenders. Yep. So, but but we do have DCF on the list, and DCF. I know that in the past, Sheila had expressed interest in um, the other side of DCF, which is the termination of parental rights um, and the taking away of kids and in, into custody. Um, so once you get DCF at the table, they have two primary data systems. They um, were born in 1984, the data systems. So there you go. Um, and uh, yeah, but they have two data systems. It's the same data system that uh, the same two data systems that collect information for both their delinquency stuff and their um, care and protection. Okay. Let yeah. me, Elizabeth. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to add to that a little bit. Um, yeah, our, our data systems are from the early 1980s, so they are incredibly limited. So I will just kind of leave that yeah. there. I'm <laughs> More, more of the details of that, um, but um, it, it can be difficult for us to even get data on our own and to figure out what our current caseload is or looks like or has for certain periods of time. Um, but uh, we are in the process of starting some of the beginning steps to uh, transitioning to CWIS for our child welfare, uh, which is which is great, but it's only small portions of it. It's not the whole the whole data changeover. Okay. Uh, with, uh, Witchy? Yeah, I have a follow-up question, and I'm sorry if I'm taking us down a rabbit hole. Feel free to pull me back out. Um, but I'm almost wondering, should our report then include making sure that there's additional resources for these departments that we're going to want, like DCF, to make sure that, you know, data is being able to take care of? Because, like, it, it's going to be, uh, kind of, it, it, it'll, it'll be bad if we're like, hey, DCF, give us data. And we're like, well, where are the resources? I don't know. So it's just making sure that we include that in the report, I guess. There will need to be a pointed paragraph about funding. We have done that before. <laughs> pointed paragraphs are not foreign to the RDAP. We can write a pointed paragraph about this is going to cost you. <laughs> I I will just get say, over it. Um, yeah. Which they either will or they won't. I mean, I mean, I don't know. You know, I, we can. We're making a suggestion. We can't. We're not the lawmakers. And so I I mean I think it, you know it's important. Certainly, as a veteran of last summer. It's really important for us to bear that in mind because um, we we went down collectively went down a rabbit hole last summer. I don't even remember which one it was. It we went we were so in the weeds on a data question, and it was like all of a sudden it was like whoa we're just like not educated to do this, and I to everybody and went, let's pull back. We can't answer this. And I'm going to try to be mindful of that with this report as well so we don't get sucked in anywhere. Um, oh. Rebecca, you've got your, your, your uh, life on the verb. Well, Go I'm for it. I'm taking notes and building columns and, 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 and then making a mess of my own formatting. But Elizabeth, yeah. uh, good to see you. My list for core stakeholders for the juvenile side versus the adult side is longer, adding basically Department of Ed, DCF. I added ADS and CJCs to both sides of those. Um, and then also, not yeah. to hurt you, I apologize, but barge providers are actually the ones who primarily work with juveniles in comparison to CJC. So I would just add that in on the barge side and they have contracts with DCF. Okay, right. And we have all of those contracts critical. I mean, we, we talked about um, certain providers for mental health on the adult side. Who would you see as the as the critical service providers and, and others who, who or other organizations for on the juvenile side? 
can just capture, not lose. Specifically for mental health or on a broader and sense? A broader sense for juvenile delinquencies. Um, definitely the barge would be number one on, on our end. Um, and then some of our residential programs, to be quite honest, um, like, you know, thinking about SEAL, et cetera. So I would want that. That would, I mean, they're a huge, huge piece of our DCF work, our contracts. And I'm even thinking of, for instance, the entity um, Beckett that is holding the contract for the new secure, um, secure residential program. Um, that is re essentially replacing Woodside. Um, that would be off the top of my head, the, the biggest pieces that I would want to add. Um, but I can also um, do some connecting here to see if there's any others that other people or Tyler might think of too. Okay. And I'll, I'll bring in uh, Marshall Paul's suggestions. I didn't get a chance. He's the juvenile defender at the Defender General's office. We, I'm curious. Um, what are some holes that, what have we not done? What have we not thought of? I see Mark's, Mark's joined. And I appreciate Julio, you putting those links in because Eitan, to answer your question, what holes have we not done? I think what we haven't done is specifically what interest areas do we want to make sure are represented from the community side? Because we just went through and identified the government stakeholders. We also went through and listed names of organizations off the top, but thinking categorically more of an approach, right? Um, who do we, who would, just, just again, the brainstorming mentality side of things, like what side? I mean, I want to make sure we cover, um, we had mental health down. We have, um, we threw out. I, life. Victims? I know that traditionally we've been looking at the response of the criminal justice system and how people of color are reacting or interacting with um, the weight of the state uh, taking away their liberty. Um, but there would also be discrimination in the way the weight of the state treats victims. Noted. I got, um, Susanna just put immigration in, non citizen uh, yes. immigration issues. Yeah. Really. Really there, there is a non, um, they're not statutorily created, but there is a JJ stakeholder group that is made up of all, um, so Marshall Paul's on that group, DCF's on that group, DOC's on that group, uh, Judge Gerson joins that group, uh, we have um, a, a wide breadth, um, and I don't know if it would be easier to have like a representative from that group be added instead of trying to go through the list and ask every one of those people to, but um, sometimes that might make, make, might make things easier when you, if you have one group that's already convening with all those stakeholders together. Mm. What specific communities uh, from the BIPOC communities should we make sure to have? I mean, I think this is important, like in terms of a process of making sure we have um, representatives, right? Of, I mean, we said racial justice organizations generally earlier and just started listing them, but we didn't necessarily think about what perspectives and voices are being um, covered by those, those racial justice organizations. Um, it's just a suggestion for me. I mean, I, I'm sort of channeling chief Don Stevens um, here and making sure that um, that when we talk about racial justice that uh, we're talking about, and, and I know Robin and Karen, a lot of the data we see is, is black versus, you know, white, and we don't, um, and I, we've heard a lot of people talk about why there isn't the further break, breakdown, Asian Americans, right, uh, Latinx, but I would suggest we have, we make sure that those perspectives from the various um, Race, race and ethnicity groups, and we talk about it generally in our demographic points, but we're not like, I think it would be important at this point to make sure and spell out like, who are we talking about? I'm, you know, I'm wondering, we have a list of languages 
In which they give us of maybe what? I can't remember. Susanna, you know. It's the law. I'm sorry. Can you just repeat that one more time? I was just saying we have a list of like, oh, I don't know, 15 languages in which, into which state documents are translated at this point. It might be nice to use that as a way of targeting our efforts to specific communities that the Somali community, for instance, in the north end of Burlington. Um, yes. So Vermont's 10 most- in Brattleboro. Just put in the chat a list of Vermont's most commonly spoken languages. Uh, those are not, unfortunately, all the languages into which we're translating everything yet. Mm -hmm. But that is the goal. Susanna, what is the ranking um, order for demand or highest need? Because I thought there was it was Nepali. Yeah, so actually, yeah, so the list that I put in the chat is alphabet is in alphabetical order. That's not necessarily the order of commonality. And interestingly enough, uh, what I learned from Judge Waples in the judiciary was that the three languages that are most commonly requested for court translation are not Vermont's three most common non-English languages. So depending on the context that we're looking at, the ranking is going to shift a little bit. Ooh, do you have those differences in the actual languages? I can get them. I've had... A I've had conversations with AALV about this, so I'll have to dig that up. And then the court one, it's in a physical notebook somewhere in an 11 foot vicinity here. So I'm going to stealthily try it. to find that. I love the 11 foot vicinity. That's incredible. Um, I don't think that would narrow it down in my house. But I did want to say Seema Kumar is the judiciary's recent and very exciting new hire dedicated to language access, a staff attorney, I think, out of Montpelier. And she and I have been talking and she is working hard to implement the judiciary's new language access manual, which is pretty exciting. Ooh, look at that. That's it. Um, and, and so, in fact, when I talked to her, I was like, you need to come to RDAP and just share like what you're hearing and things. Because I, I'm going to botch the order, but it was something like Nepali, Somali, Vietnamese, like Spanish yeah. and French just down, like, you know, like not, not there. And again, it's different though, if you do it by county, right? Like I think it's right. numbers are demand, greatest demand. And then that brings you down to essentially Chittenden. Right. But I think that the language interpretation day, uh, demand, I suspect, would be different in Wyndham, right, or Bennington. You're not going to have the high needs for Nepali interpreters in Wyndham or in Bennington. Right. Um, but I like that idea in terms of the difference. But I just think, that, yeah, looking at the language groups and making some assumptions from there is not a bad idea. It's kind of standard anthropological practice, not without its problems, but it can be a good place to start. Mm -hmm. So I, I just am thinking that that would that would help too. Is you know, and that could be lines in the report. A representative from the Somali speaking community, something like that, some some line that doesn't overly prescribe what we're talking about. But that the mission statement itself that we've already been working on would help shape. That's my thought, at least. Anything else? Because I'm really willing to sit down and start write, you know, like writing stuff this week. I think we really kind of have to start doing. I mean, we have been doing that. I shouldn't say that. I'm sorry, everybody. That came out like your mother. I'm. I wasn't trying to be this. 
disciplinary. I'm just sort of like, we've already started writing stuff down. I'm just saying we should keep doing that because we did promise the rest of the body to um, I think this would be a very to Hey, Tom, hey, Tom, you're breaking see, up a yeah. lot. You might, you uh, might not uh, be uh, yeah. Sorry, sorry. I'm breaking up in more ways than can possibly be imagined. <laughs> Witchy, please. <laughs> Um, I just was thinking, as we mentioned, a lot of names that um, those won't always be the social justice organizations. Those won't always be the languages, right? So, like, um, our environment is going to change, and we want it to change, right? Like, that's the purpose of we're doing this. So, I'm wondering um, if anybody had any ideas of, like, um, how we foresee this governing body being able to change and adapt with uh, the environment that, that exists at the moment. Like maybe there can, go ahead. Can you tell me more about what you're, you're getting at? Because the the environment that exists at the moment can you can you give me some more shape to that sure so i'll, I'll do something that i think is probably s relatively simple to understand like for example <laughs> right now we're talking a lot about like somalis be, like we need somali representation and nepali representation because that's the language that we're seeing me being needed the most in in judicial courts or you know whatever um but you know Next year, it might be uh, uh, um, Afghanis. I don't know how to say the plural, but uh, Afghans, right? So, like, how do we then uh, make sure that next year um, the people who do need representation on that governing body are given that representation and um, and sort of that, that change of environment um, is... Is, for, is provided into the governing body, es especially because the point of the data warehouse, right, is to be able to assess and address these racial disparities. So hypothetically, things will change because they're gonna get better and then we'll see another group that needs it. Thank you. Term yeah, limits. I Sorry, Susanna, go ahead. No, no, I was just gonna say, I think that that highlights the need to have a regular review process. Right. We're going to set something in motion today. And if we're doing our jobs right, then that means it's going to move the needle. And when the when the needle moves, then at that point, we've got to step back and reassess. Maybe that means every year or every two years, or every three years that we go back and say, OK, um, based on the progression of data, do we need to shift certain things? Right. Like maybe we saw a particular age group was more vulnerable and we've targeted that age group and then we remedied that inequity. And now we say, OK, maybe that disparity has been mitigated, but there's another age group that we have to be looking at, or maybe there's another core issue that it's not related to age. So I think maybe just a building in a regular review so that things that we take as assumptions today don't remain assumptions in the future. Ian, if you would please make sure to make a good note of that, because that seems critical. Understood. Thank you. Anybody else? I have one more suggestion Actually, for somebody to add or a subject matter expert. Like, so I think there was a bucket on there for subject matter experts. And um, there's a whole bunch of IDC 10 billing codes for police brutality. So you can find, you know, um, so there, and there's a lot of public data in Vermont um, on hospital and ER discharges. But um, I think that that's a valuable data source. And Medicaid and Medicare, uh, Medicaid data, um, so for people who go to the primary care physician and seek treatment for um, injuries sustained by law enforcement, um, there's a billing code for that. And that all lives in our uh, Medicaid 
Um, Robin, this is Rebecca. Are you are yep. you saying you're saying we should consider the the um, hospitals? Are, are, are... Not so much the hospitals. So the hospitals release public data sets on emergency room discharges and hospital discharges. Um, but I, I, so I've worked with those data sets, and I just happened to look up like what 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 are the billing codes for police brutality, and there are some. Um, and so usually when um, special groups are working with on these billing codes, there's uh, first you need an expert in those codes on when you're supposed to use them and when you're not supposed to. Um, so that's why I said in that subject matter expert kind of field. And then there's also, and this may be something that RDAP or somebody or, you know, the advocacy organizations want to do, is to train or to get the word out there that there, there are these, I, these billing codes and these are data points that people have access to. Um, to try to measure things and to encourage people to use them. Yeah. Thanks for bringing it up. No, no, and thanks for bringing it up. It actually is, it is a huge um, untapped, uh, sort of untapped field of understanding that data and what's going on there with the relationships and what we're actually focused on, which is how do people get detected and, and who's passing, you know, how many people right. who's making these decisions to pass and call law enforcement in or or however, to who's discharging, who's not. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, the consequences of those billing codes um, also uh, influences what services you're going to be eligible for. Right. Right. Yeah. Which she... Right. Yeah, I have a note on that because I, I work with healthcare data um, and I've worked in Vermont hospitals. Um, <laughs> I didn't know that was, there was, well, I didn't know there was an ICD-10 code for that, but that's really cool. But I do want to say that I think if we, if that's something that we want to tap into, then the people that we want to have be part of that conversation are not necessarily the hospitals, but those that govern um, the, qual uh, the quality reporting for the hospital. So we're talking about yeah. like, um, CMS, or we're talking about uh, um, maybe uh, Green Mountain Care Board. Uh, so just like noting like who has the power to make sure that that data touches. Just want to put that out there. Would yeah. it be the Green Mountain Care Board? I I I just mentioned that because that was on my brain. Um, I don't know that that's the actual answer, but that's where I would start to look. Okay. And for us, like when we were doing a, a study on how injurious domestic violence is, we talked to the, like the same nurses. They're the ones that use those codes. And so understanding how they were trained to use those codes um, was helpful. I don't know who, if anyone, is trained specifically on, and there's a lot of police brutality codes, all the ways they can injure you. Um, so I don't know who in the state is, is trained on that. Or who, or is there, would you, anyone responsible for IDC and training in general? I like, wouldn't know that. We would have to talk to like somebody from a quality department at a hospital okay. to know more about that. Yeah. Do we need also, I'm thinking of my friend Karen Tron Scott Scarab and her or the, the organization around, um, domestic violence, we were talking earlier about victims as well um, and the fact that bias can enter into um, governmental dealings with victims. Should that be another organization and another vector in all of this that we ought to be considering? Can you say that one more time, Nathan? Yeah, maybe. Um, I think so. Um, we were talking about how people who are victims um, can be dealt with by various, you know, criminal justice system, whatever system, in ways that allow for the entrance of bias. Should we therefore with representatives from those communities onto the boards that we are imagining at this point. I would advocate for the network also because they are a service provider for people who won't 
necessarily go to the criminal justice system. So I'm thinking for people um, who get the relief from abuse orders, that's outside the criminal justice system. Um, And I know when I've worked with them in the past, uh, especially when it comes to uh, human trafficking um, and the the Vermont Legal Partnership, which represents uh, people in crime, people who have who have um, been the victim of crime, but you don't necessarily need to go to the cops to get their services. Um, And so part of that that understanding in in their work is why don't people go to the cops um i mean it, hearing it from the service providers because that does change over time and it changes over location i think is helpful okay good good thank you robin yep anybody else I am sensing running out of steam. <laughs> well, you called me out, Dayton, but I actually saw Susanna's uh, chat comment here. Oh, okay. Let me know because I can't. If I go to chat, something evil happens. My bad. I, I can say it. I just didn't want to interrupt the conversation. I was asking if we had if we had mentioned cultural brokers and interpreters specifically. I know we kind of talked around the translation issue. And the reason that I talked about interpreters specifically is because oftentimes they fall through the cracks in between other categories. So they're not exactly the same as the limited English proficient population, but they're also often not court staff or medical staff or whatever, but they're very necessary in those rooms but no one necessarily claims ownership. And the example that I used in the chat was when we were doing a lot of testing and vaccination for COVID-19, you know, all the hospitals dealt with their staff and, you know, other stakeholders who are patients were also, you know, serviced, but nobody was saying, we're gonna claim ownership of the cultural brokers and make sure that they're being served or prioritized. So that's kind of a population that's in between others. Okay, thank you. Mm-hmm. Thinking. I, yeah, that's a really that's an it's a subtle way to get at a different perspective from people with lived experiences and people represent the community because oftentimes these interpreters are coming from the community, right? Um, Vermont or community more broadly speaking, um, you know, regionally if they come in. So I think that's that is really great, good idea. I like that I like that calling it cultural brokers sort of captures a lot of what they're doing. <laughs> the other side of that is social workers, which we don't have um, enough of um, but that brings the same kind of concept to mind and we've talked about who is providing the mental health um, care a little bit you know name some some programs um, you know in terms of the educators and we haven't really talked about that in terms of the children kids and and um, counselors side of things social worker inside um, Again, I, I hope when I come back next week, I'll have some, some more names, but um, there are lots of ways to get at why, you know, Karen, Robin, I was just thinking about understanding why people don't report things to the police, right? Um, a lot of ways yeah. to go back, not just saying, oh, it has to only come from uh, the complainant's perspective, right? Um, right. Is to me, like who is a victim? It's again. I know these terms are used often, so I'm not gonna get on a soapbox and talk about why. Um, but to be careful with language, right? And what we mean. And I'm, I'm taking you to mean specifically complainants um, and organizations that represent complainants in the criminal and juvenile justice system. But when we talk about more broadly speaking, of like why is there distrust of law enforcement? Um, right. I do think that is an important point you're making and making sure that we get those various perspectives um, covered. Um, but to reduce it just to one side in these court proceedings is an incomplete um, picture. Uh, and also starts to 
um, again, back to the balancing of who is going to be part of this board. I mean, there's one thing is we're, we're making a list like it's merging. I'm not trying to of who who has who, who has data that we want to make sure we can think about capturing and looking at and understanding and then who should be sitting at the governing table or who should be sitting at a different table relating to the data nuts and bolts things. Or whether they should yeah, so I want to say that the network actually, so anyone who gets really good federal funding has really good data. Um, and the network gets a lot of federal funding. And, and I know the data system that they use. And it's the one that I, uh, for any service provider, I actually recommend that they use the one that the network is using because it's easy to get the data out of. It's customizable on the user end. Um, and uh, they have to, so there's a lot of reporting um, that uh, Office of Victim Services requires at the federal level um, that's standardized across a lot of um, service providers of people who may not um, be going to the, to the criminal justice system but um, feel that, that they are victimized in some way. So there's, there's a lot of data there, is what I'm saying. Okay. Uh, and, you know, legal aid serves a lot of victims of crime. They have a code in their system, so we know it's a victim of a crime. Um, uh, and, you know, they do a lot of work on the evictions and the, and the collateral, collateral consequences of crime, which may also have um, race or ethnic implications. Well, it does. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, so who on the, like, would you be interested in um, an organization that, say, helps the um, respondents in the RFA cases and their views of procedural justice? Because that's also important. Um, I know for a while down in Bennington, Attorney Bragdon was doing that kind of um, off the record for or with Matt's permission. But I don't, the way we don't have, I know that we had re recommended a few years ago, like a public defender for people who are being served with an RFA, but we did, we never did that, did we? Mm. Um, New York does that. Uh, so we had recommended that, that Vermont adopt the New York system because that if you feel like you have procedural justice, um, and hopefully it's not just a feeling, you actually had procedural justice, um, then you're less likely to violate the restraining order. Okay. Robin, thanks for bringing up legal aid. I was remiss in, in dropping them off by earlier. And, you know, there was a recent change in the law this past session, which um, made them, um, created a mandate to have them, legal aid attorneys, represent people who are in hospitalization uh, hearings. And that is sort of a, a, a change. It's, it's, a, it's a change and it's sort of a transition of passing the baton from where a defender's office will represent someone. Um, and then when they go into the hospitalization uh, statutory code area, the legal aid um, attorneys will take over and represent. Um, and so they should definitely be brought to this uh, side, because not, at least for the mental health cases. They're very much involved. Elizabeth, oh, turn my, my camera off. There, Elizabeth. <laughs> um, I want to make sure that in all that you're hearing, we have a history as a panel of, and we don't like it, we get mad at ourselves, of juvenile justice sort of kind of, oh, right. We have to do that too. And I want to make sure that in what you're hearing so far, you're not feeling like some there's a major hole or a major hole that we aren't addressing that can be addressed. No, I, I think you're doing doing a good job. And I think the reality is, is that when we're talking about stakeholder groups, um, most of these entities interact with kids just as much as they interact with adults and they have um you know a youth side to things in addition um i just think that when we're you know when we're talking about making sure that mental health you know whoever from the mental health agencies or whatnot are going to be there that when they're there that they know that they're also focusing on and 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 are essentially 
representing, I guess is the word I'll use for lack of a better one, um, their juvenile services just as much as their adult services. The big mm -hmm. divide um, and the big change that I really see is when it comes to like the diversion programs and bar and CJCs really don't utilize um, or or serve youth as much as uh, barge providers do. Um, so, so that would be the biggest piece that I see when it comes to these. I do think when we are talking about, and I, I do think we might want to wrangle a little bit more about education and pieces of that, because I know that that is a larger perhaps beast than um, I think maybe we're ready to, to work with. I do know that the legislature recently, so we all know the legislature creates a lot of boards, but they created a new board specifically to talk about uh, racial um, disparity data within school discipline. Right. Uh, and I think that um, that group um, is made up of, you know, they did their own process of talking about who should who should come to that meeting, but perhaps making sure that we have an entity from that group as well when we're talking through these things, because um, they spent a lot of time and AOE did um, presentations as well to the legislature to show to say, hey, we have all this data on our site and they're going to do presentations to that board and maybe um, having some of our RDAP group. Um, join in when it, when AOE does that presentation to that board, so we can also see okay what what is already there um, or pieces like that. So that's the biggest thing I would say. And I know um, you know the thing that I always wrestle with when it comes to education is you know my understanding is that they report every time that an incident um, gets you know referred to law enforcement of some kind, but we never are able to track it through the system and say, okay, there was an incident that occurred in a school or, um, but what happened to that kid? Is that kid, you know, thinking back to the school to prison pipeline, for instance, did that youth end up in Woodside? And that's been really difficult, I know, to mm -hmm. find. So I'm just kind of thinking through all these different situations, but I'll stop there. I feel like I went on a little, a little bit of a <laughs> unrelated <laughs> tangent. So before I continue. Okay, thank you, thank you. Witchy? Yeah, I'd be happy um, if we're trying to send representatives over. I'd be happy to um, like consider going to to the data uh, thing. I feel like I could probably capture some uh, some things and just bring it back from the t uh, data tech perspective. That would be a great kindness. Um, Truly. Yeah, uh, uh, how would I know when it's going to happen? Is that the thing that Karen's supposed to be doing? Oh. What do you I think? Is, is that the, like, so we're Karen, so we have that other grants um, that's, that's paying for search to help with the data integration and ADS, and we were going to put together a group of the nuts and bolts people and invite Witchy. Is it that one, Witchy, that you're talking about? We haven't done that yet. Uh... Or would you, were you referring to the um, the other board that it, the legislature just created this spring um, that is going to get, if they haven't already, a presentation from AOE about what data they have available on the website, how to how to find it, et cetera. And then that entity um, is responsible for um, making recommendations to AOE about um, specifically race data within school discipline. Um, and they have a list of, of data points that they want regarding that too. Is that what you're referring to? First of all, I feel so wanted with all of these opportunities. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I meant the latter um, and I know the former is, is coming. Okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I met the education data uh, with uh, that they were going to report to AOE. I feel like that would be good to sort of take and bring back to that nuts and bolts uh, committee. Yeah. So the I, I guess I my question is into that um, and see if I can follow up and um, and where they are with that. So I think that they were slated to start having meetings this fall. So I'll 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 look into it. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Karen, do you, uh, Karen, Robin, <laughs> yep. do you know where, where, I know, right? Um, 
where we're get where where things are at with getting that group that's looking at the nuts and bolts as we're calling yeah, it. Yeah, we're um yeah, so a few things. First of all, uh, apologies to everyone. We are on our federal fiscal year deadlines and finishing up some major studies. So, um there's that and then one of the funders for that project um uh, we're waiting to hear from them um, for the position at ADS. So this grant would fund a position at ADS that would be the project manager for the um, data integration piece for the Bureau. Um, so we're kind of waiting to see, um, and we're hoping to have an answer. We keep hoping to have an answer by, by Friday on where Arnold Foundation is with that funding um, and if we can start using that money right away. So. The short answer is probably not till October is when we would meet. Okay. Well, it'll be a hair pull. Which is like two weeks, right? Like, All right. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> right. It's, yeah, I have to remember. It is towards the end of September already. All right. Um, other thoughts, because there's a lot here. I'm really ready to take a stab at writing this week and getting some uh, drafting about what governing bodies might look like um, out to you for the usual, you know, criticism, critique, rebuilding, et cetera that we've been doing. Um, and I feel like there's a lot here already that's gonna make this somewhat challenging, but that makes it fun. Uh, um, I may re rely on some of you, I, not, not even may, I will rely on some of you expect an email or something um about uh this stuff because i there's a lot of it that will start confusing me at a certain point you, you all, all know that um uh but I, that's the goal I'm setting myself for this week, to be able to do something concrete so that when we come back together next Monday, there is an actual document of sorts that we can start uh, chipping away at. Rebecca, you look a little, I don't know what you look. <laughs> You're thinking. No, I'm thinking, I'm listening. Um, you know, one, one, more, just one like, more thought. Rebecca, one more are thought. you there? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, I wasn't no. sure. A little one more thought while I was listening to you as you're drafting, and I thank you, Eitan, for taking the first stab at it. We've been talking about who should be at the table. Um, I don't know what people think about that it's people who get to choose who should be at the table, right? I mean, we're, it, 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 it's a subtlety, but it's, it's, a, it's, I think maybe leave that for us to think about next time. It's like, cause a lot of these, it's like the governor's picking the chief justice picks, the blah, blah, blah picks, you know? Um, well, why not these organizations pick who should be? Right. Right. I mean, it's sort of an equity of of how who who right. who can sit at the table. Um, anyways, just a thought. That was what I was thinking when you asked me. No, that's a good point. I mean, it only happened with the Criminal Justice Council in some. But I don't even know who did that, who wrote in two people or whatever recommended by each chapter of the NAACP. I don't remember how that got in there. But yeah, and it wasn't consistent. Anything else anyone wants to bring up? No? Then, I will, I will start in on this.
It will be. I'm sorry. I just formed the idea right after you took away the offer to speak. Um, I wanted, I don't even know if we need to be thinking about this right now, but I'm thinking about the draft legislation that we're supposed to be providing. And I know yeah. that Representative Lalonde very helpfully said that he could help make uh, ledge counsel available to the group. And I also know that the legislature has a deadline for drafting requests, et cetera. Yes. And I just want to make sure that whoever is the ledge counsel who's on point for criminal justice issues, that we can learn from them how, um, you know, just in case there's anything else coming down the pipeline that's relevant to this, that somebody is aware. Do you know what I mean? I'm not I'm not saying it right, but basically, well, but I think thinking- we should be in contact with drafters at some point early on so that there but- aren't. There's the situation that always happens doesn't happen where there's like six different public safety bills on the same topic. Right. What if we made a go at this this week and then got in touch with Ledge Council? Like a week from tomorrow, for instance. Because I think it will be Eric Fitzpatrick, from what I've been told. And what if we make a go at this and then call him in? Does that seem reasonable? Yes, Eton, I would only make the recommendation that you should should probably reach out to Senator Sears and Representative Grad um, and, and Lalonde and Coach and all the ones who've been very invested in this to, to let them know and see who they would be working with because they'll know. Um, I will- there's a recommendation to, to to reach out to Luke, who in the chat, who is of course the head of the uh, Ledge Council. Uh, Luke, uh, what's his last name? Shoot. I can't remember. I'm blanking. Um, but I either plan. way, it's a good idea, Susanna. And I think is it mid November? Julio will probably mid- first November first, but it's soon. Um, yeah. I think we should probably should, like let them know we'd something by mid August. Like we should, we would want them in. I don't know how much they, you know. Are, what are we? We have two more weeks until the first of August. I mean October, and then we want to take this decision-making points to the main body of RDAP to get some key decisions. Drafting. Sears and Grad at all tomorrow Marland? morning. Marland. That we would like. We'd like contact with Ledge Council sooner rather than later. Good. That's great. Okay. I'll do that. I'll remember that. Got that. Thank you, Susanna. Anything else anybody has? Or do we have enough to get started for this week? Well, I think that is a lot. I do too. <laughs> I think you to take the lion's share, but feel free to reach out. Oh, I'm going to be reaching out, yes, because it's, it's, this is going to get, this is going to, I'm going to come back, I'm letting you all know now it's going to be a mess. I mean, it really is going to be a mess. I'm really anticipating you all taking it next week and marking it up so that it becomes less of a mess. But as we often say, it's better to have a mess that's concrete rather than one that's abstract. So let's get something down and write on it. All right. Good. Well then, I guess we should say have a good evening. Wait, sorry, Tom, one more suggestion for next week. I was just looking at the calendars and how many Mondays we have before our next Tuesday with the big RDAP panel where we were going to present our list of things that we would hope to get a decision on. <laughs> and it looks like we have Monday and then the Monday right before the panel. So two more Mondays. What happened to the Monday? But I suggest, is that right? Like is, if the 27th or next meeting, could I suggest that we come and think about the key points that we need the panel to that we want to present, you know, how the, the the key points that we need some sense of consensus on, or Absolutely. start to build that list. 
and I would I would assume that part of it will be the constitution of this governing body. Yeah, will be huge. So sure. Okay. Ian, yeah, if you make an action an item of that as well, that would be helpful. But that's what pe people need to be thinking about. Um, big that point. next next week we'll be discussing what to bring to the main RDAP well, panel. Yes, please. Okay. Of course, of course. Yep. Thank you. All right. Anything else from anyone? All right, then. Then good evening. And I want to also just say thank you for your indulgence in getting me online. Good Lord, that was a nightmare. Susanna, thank you for, and bless your father for telling you to just say go for when it's a mess. Because <laughs> it really was there for a bit. Thanks, everybody. So, all right. Um, thank you. And see you all next week. Bye. Okay. Thanks, bye, -bye. bye. Bye. Bye.